Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and go over intelligence testing um, this uh, series just to kind of give you an idea uh, if you are interested in school psychology, clinical psychology, if you're interested in working with adolescents at all, um, then this will be something that is actually going to be um, something that you really need to know about because essentially you may or may not um, do intelligence testing, but you do need to be familiar with some of the terminology and sort of how these testings are done. Um, that way you can get an idea of um, what you may be facing if you're uh, talking to, a, for example, a troubled adolescent or a gifted adolescent is something that you, you may actually come in contact with pretty frequently. Now we're gonna talk about two main people who are involved excuse me, in designing intelligence testing, one is Binet and one is Wexler. Now, uh, in chapter three, you would learn, uh, you learn about uh, individual differences in intelligence. What is intelligence? Um, those uh, people who uh, really um, have this particular viewpoint when it comes to, to cognition, um, a, lot of, a lot of them um, really have a, a difficult time agreeing on really what intelligence is. Um, you know, we can kind of give a very general definition that intelligence is your ability to solve problems, ability to adapt and learn from everyday experiences. Um, but you know, what is intelligence? What makes up intelligence? So if you say, for example, well, I'm not very book smart, but I can take apart an engine, um, or I, you know, I'm not very book smart, I don't know uh, trivia, but I can go survive in the wild. And uh, you know, I can. I'm very, very smart in terms of knowing about different uh, plants and animals, and, and um, you know how to do that. But you know, perhaps that student isn't very good in school. Um, so you know, these are types of things that you have to think about. What is intelligence? Can we just say intelligence is just simply book smarts? And I think that we've certainly learned that that's definitely not the case. It's how you're able to take what you're given and how you're able to adapt to, to the situations. And so um, really this, uh, this major process started around 1904 when um, the French ministry asked Alfred Binet, who was a psychologist, to identify children in the schools who were not able to learn. Um, and so uh, in 1905, uh, Binet was able to develop these series of tests. Uh, the first one consisted of about 30 questions and they had questions that were like, um, here's a design and I want you to copy it uh, by me from memory um, and to see if the kids could, could remember what they saw and, and if they could re reproduce particular designs. Um, some questions were as simple as take your right hand and touch your right ear um, just to make sure they could follow instructions and you know their body parts and things like that. They were also asked to define particular abstract concepts um, that are you know rather difficult to, 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 to narrow down just to make sure that children understood uh, what uh, particular abstract concepts were of the time important to understand. And of course this changes in, 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 um, in over time um, and as you age. So um, one thing that Binet constructed was this concept of mental age. And so this was essentially um, where you are mentally um, relative to others. And so this idea of, of where you are mentally um, really drove the idea of intelligence quotient. And so his idea was essentially a formula. So um, IQ or intelligence quotient is your mental age over your chronological age times 100. So let's say uh, you are, you know, um, your, your chronological age is 16, but your mental age is 21, or your chronological age is eight years old, um, and your mental age is 20. You know, that's, that's a very advanced IQ. Um, and so, if, but let's say your mental age is 16 and your chronological age is 16, and you times, so that's one times 100 uh, equals 100, so your IQ is 100. So an average right on, on par IQ is, is essentially a 100. Um, so this was a really good starting point in figuring out, okay, how do we measure IQ and then how do we put a number to it? How do we quantify it? Um, and so this was sort of the beginning of that. 
If you look here, this is a uh, newer adaptation. You'll see this is called the Stanford Binet IQ scores. Now, Binet did the original um, scale in the early 1900s, and um, the uh, faculty at Stanford um, took this uh, Binet's work um, and uh, developed it, essentially revised it, into what we know now as the modern version, which is Stanford Binet. Um, and the newest version is the fifth edition or fifth re revision. And so here you can see that they've been broken down into what we refer to as sort of a normal uh, bell curve. And so here we have at the 100 mark, which is the chronological age um, and mental age essentially being the same, we see that that's at 50% and that's the middle of the curve. Um, and so these are essentially, you know, looking at, okay, where are you in terms of the norm? Okay, so think of these as also as percentiles. So if you have an IQ of 132, then you're at the 98th percentile, meaning you, you know, are smarter than 98% of the people. So, you know, just kind of giving you an idea of percentiles. So the Stanford Binet 5 is the most current version of the test. And um, if you see here this picture here, I've got a few other pictures to kind of show you what it looks like. Um, but I'm going to bring up a, uh, a pointer so you guys can kind of see. Now here, um, these two things here are uh, known as sort of boards. And so what they do is they actually have a, uh, a, a setup right here. They're kind of like triangles. They have a pop out where they can actually sit up. And so you would have a board that you're looking at, and then you would give your, in this case, a child, because the Stanford Binet, um, in this case, is, is looking at uh, young children. The, the child would have a board, and you would have a board. And in your board, you would have ser uh, very specific instructions about how you're supposed to administer the test. And then they have whatever they're supposed to be working on. And so uh, here we have a booklet. Here, here is a score sheet in the back, and then your, your, score, your um, actual experimental cards. So when you talk about intelligence testing, I can't just pick up a intelligence test and just administer it however I want. You have to be very specifically trained on the Stanford Binet, and it takes uh, quite a while to master it. You not only have to go through training, but you also have to be observed while you administer it to make sure that you are actually administering it correctly and appropriately without bias. You can't give hints, you can't help them out, even if you know you really like the kid or whatever. And so um, this is a very extensive process, and this is a very long test. This is not something that takes 10 minutes. You know, this, this can be a very extensive test depending on how quickly they go um, and how quickly you are in terms of administering it. Um, but it is a very exhausting test. Um, the Stanford Binet, the fifth edition, um, currently measures five main components. We have fluid reasoning, um, knowledge, quantitative reasoning, which is like math, um, visual spatial reasoning, which is like taking an object and rotating it in your head, um, <clears throat> using things without words to make sure that you understand shapes and things like that. And then you have working memory. Now working memory is a component of short-term memory, and this is sort of your area of memory that is currently working as you are solving a problem. So let's say I say, okay, um, I want you to remember every third word of the sentence that I'm saying, and then now I want you to do this math problem. Okay, what was the third word of, of, of each sentence? And so what, essentially what you're doing is you're having to hold something in your memory while you do something else, and that's essentially the concept of working memory. And so these questions are designed to get at kids that, um, you know, to really see how, what capacity are they working in and is it normal for their particular age. Now, here's an example of a setup here. So you get the bag, and then you have cups, you have blocks, you have the, the boards here, the test booklet, um, all sorts of things to work with. And then you would essentially carry that around with you every time you administer the test. Here is an example of a score sheet. Um, and so, for example, let's say a child is, um, you know, messing up or you know is not answering correctly then it depends on how they're doing you may have to progress backward you may have to go to a separate set of questions you may have to just skip it and move forward if they can't do it um, you would essentially put the age of the child 
and then their score and then figure out what percentile they are what their actual IQ is based off of that. Now here's an actual example. Um, so this Stanford Binet, this uh, uh, part of the bottom you can see here <clears throat> says pre-K to second grade. So you know looking at that you know particular uh, age yeah uh, you know young age we're, we're looking at you know four uh, five, six, seven, four to seven ish. Um, here we see uh, this is what the child is given. So there's a girl and she's holding a, a tennis racket and she sh and here the child is shown a tennis ball. So it makes sense, right? This is a reasoning question. So this uh, person is holding a tennis racket and the next thing they see is a tennis ball. Here we have a child holding a baseball bat. So the next thing that makes sense is what? What um, uh, sports equipment should be here or person or whatever should be here that makes sense with this matrix. And here the child is, is correctly pointing to the baseball bat. So here it, the baseball bat goes along with the picture. So this is an example of a child answering correctly. This looks complicated um, and it can get very frustrating. Um, so this is what a child is shown um, and they're given these, these are blocks. So they can turn these blocks, they can move them. They actually have to place the blocks in the right pattern to match this picture. And again, it can get very frustrating and it can get um, very complicated, but they have you know, a certain amount of time that they can use to essentially put together a matching pattern. And once they end, you of course have to stop the clock uh, or stop them and then determine if they get it right. So you actually have to look at the pattern to make sure it's correct. So that's an example. Those are you know, kind of a run through of the Stanford Binet. Now the Wexler uh, scale, so Stanford Binet is, is pretty pretty popular um, uh, set of, of IQ tests that, that's used. Wexler in 1939 um, first developed the Wexler Bellevue uh, intelligence scale, and that was because he worked for the Bellevue um, Psychiatric Hospital in New York City. He didn't really believe in this idea of mental age, although it's very similar what he believed. Um, he believed that normal intelligence could be constructed as an average test score for a particular group, which is the same kind of concept. Um, and this means that the average score is 100 on a standard scale, which is you know, really what we see as the Stanford Binet anyway. In 1949, he ended up publishing a children's version, um, and that, of course, has gone through many revisions. Um, and he has many versions of this test. So these are all the Wexler scales. Um, and uh, we have, of course, different versions. Um, these are the most uh, updated versions. So we have the WACE, which is the adult intelligence scale, the WISC, which is the um, intelligence scale for children, which you may actually see if you see some adolescents come in who had had their uh, intelligence uh, quotient taken or their, their IQ taken. Um, as young children, you might see WISC-4 scores, or depending on when they had it done, WISC-3, um, but uh, WISC-4 is the most updated version. That goes up to 16 years. And then the WIPC. The WIPC is for very young children, um, so that goes about two and a half years to seven years and three months, and uh, that is for uh, you know, very young children. So the, the scales all provide this overall IQ, um, as well as uh, many uh, composite scores, very similar to how Stanford Binet is constructed. We saw the five composite scores that made up the Stanford Binet. So the WACE, which again here is the adult scale. The WACE, you see verbal comprehension, working memory, processing speed. These are just a few of the indices that we see in the WACE, um, just that makes up that intelligent uh, intelligence score. Um, this is a sample, uh, an old version, an old sample. Um, what day uh, of the year is Independence Day? Um, how are wool and cotton alike? Again, the ways, all of these Wexler scales require that a person is trained very, very well into this and they have to administer it and be observed while they administer it so many times before they're allowed to do it on their own. Um, uh, you know, so, so some of these questions like, uh, you know, tell me the meaning of corrupt. Uh, why do people buy fire insurance? Um, and then digit span is a very popular, popular uh, uh, component um, to see how well people can follow digits um, and how well they can remember. Um, so this is a very good example of a digit span test. Listen carefully and when I'm through, say the numbers right after me. 
7-3-4-1-8-6. Now I'm going to say some more numbers, but I want you to say them backwards. 3-8-4-1-6. So the person is supposed to say 6 one 4 eight. This is a very frustrating test, um, and so it can get uh, very frustrating for the for the person because they um, need to make sure that they actually follow along and they're listening, and also that they can work numbers forwards and backwards. Um, and so there's a lot of different examples um, that you can probably find online if you're very interested. This is the kit, very similar to the, the Stanford Binet, where there's a score sheet, you've got blocks, because when you're trying to measure visual spatial, you do not want verbal memory to get in there. You just want it to be a complete separate thing that you're testing. You want to see how good their verbal memory is. You also want to see how good their visual memory is, how good their spatial memory is. So it's broken down into, into subcomponents and components. And so here's the, the bag, and then you would have all the, the parts and the blocks and the, and the boards and the um, scorecards and all that for each one. So that's just a quick kind of rundown of the different um, of the different tests, um, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of uh, what what essentially what these look like. Um, and so, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, you know, this is something that's very very good to know if you are uh, going into these particular areas. If you're going to work with adolescents, is something that you really really want to know about. So um, I encourage questions if you have them, um, and I hope that you enjoyed this um, series.